Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement as we go in search of history. Journey to a spectacular city in the Jordanian desert, carved from solid rock and hidden from Westerners for over 1,500 years. Who built these remarkable structures and what secrets lay buried beneath them? The mountains of present-day Jordan, a formidable barrier between the fertile lands of Palestine and the vast deserts of Arabia, and keepers of a 2,000-year-old secret. In the year 1812, a young Swiss adventurer named Johann Ludwig Burckhardt discovered that secret. Disguised as an Arab merchant, he was traveling south through the biblical lands of Palestine. Bedouin nomads had told Burckhardt of a wondrous ancient city hidden inside a mountain. Burkhardt came in search of this forgotten treasure. His guides led Burkhardt into a twisting gorge so narrow that in places it threatened to blot out the sun. Behind him lay the danger of a flash flood or of attack by nomadic tribesmen, the Bedouin, who killed any foreigner they found in their domain. Before him lay only the unknown. Suddenly the canyon walls closed in, daylight all but disappeared, and then in the darkness the secret was revealed. The astonished Burkhardt beheld a massive structure carved from the mountain's rock. That would have been surprising enough but it was only the beginning. As he penetrated deeper into the sandstone gorges, Burkhart saw hundreds of other monuments carved from the mountains with consummate skill, scattered for miles along the canyon walls. Burkhardt dared not share his excitement with his Bedouin guides. Only his disguise protected him from instant death. But as a well-trained historian, he knew that he had stumbled upon what could only be an ancient civilization long forgotten by the Western world. Johann Ludwig Burkhardt had found the hidden glory of Petra. It's the most mysterious place you you can't help but think, who were these people who came here and settled and did this? Where did they get these ideas? What, you almost want to think, you know, who had, who had the gall to do this? Today, Petra's location is no mystery. It lies a few dozen miles north of the Red Sea in the modern nation of Jordan. Although only a fraction of the city has been excavated, archaeologists estimate that once it covered an area the size of Lower Manhattan. As in Burkhardt's time, Petra evokes wonder in all who behold it. Along its rugged canyons, ancient hands once carved multicolored sandstone into a magnificent city. In the hard desert, the builders of Petra chiseled an opulent splendor, curiously resembling the architecture of Greece and Rome. In their hands, a sandstone cliff became a theater which held 8,000 people.
A mountainside became a massive building nearly 150 feet high. Caverns became immense royal tombs. But who were the people who carved these astonishing monuments? And how could they have carved them out of solid rock? For centuries, the Bedouin of southern Jordan wrapped Petra's history in a veil of legend. To the Bedouin, Petra is a haunted place, the abode of the jinn. The jinn are the goblins of desert folklore, invisible demons who haunt deserted places, pestering unwary humans. The Bedouin tribe knows them all too well. Once we were traveling through here, the jinn gave us a very hard time. Some were screaming, some howling, some laughing, some choking, acting like children or crazy old people. As soon as the sun sets, they assemble. You hear screaming, you hear singing. Really, it's a shameful thing. There is a lot of it in Petra. The Badul are the descendants of nomads who once jealously guarded the secret of the great city hidden in their mountains. One reason Petra lay so long undiscovered by the West was that the Bedouin killed any foreigners who came near it. In Bedul folklore, Petra was the spot where the Bible tells us Moses split solid rock with his rod to find water for his people. The Bedul believe that the narrow gorge Burkhardt followed to the city is the cleft made by Moses' staff. They say that the huge carved building Burkhardt saw was made by Moses' arch enemy, the Pharaoh of Egypt. Once we start looking at the myths of Petra, we run into the Pharaoh. Uh, because all of Petra is, is just tied into this whole story of the, uh, the Pharaoh of Egypt chasing the children of Israel. Well, he was supposed to have been drowned on the way, but according to local legend, of course, he arrived at Petra. The Bedouin believe that the pharaoh hid his enormous wealth inside an urn atop the building they call the treasury. The treasury's urn is pockmarked by hundreds of Bedouin bullets fired over the centuries in the hope that the shattered urn would release a shower of gold. Whenever people came to visit, they would say that since this was a treasury, if they knocked down the upper part, gold would pour down on them. They would fire at it, but there was no gold whatsoever. That was all nonsense. In spite of the legends, no treasure has yet been found anywhere at Petra. The urn is a well-known symbol that often is found on tombs in the Greco-Roman world. Presumably it's the urn in which the ashes or the spirit of the dead person resides. Um, and the treasury is almost certainly the tomb of one of the early kings. Archaeologists have counted nearly 800 carved tombs at Petra. Could it have simply been a vast cemetery? Most scholars believe that in ancient times, Petra was more a city of the living than of the dead. 2,000 years ago, while Jesus walked the hills of Galilee less than 200 miles away, as many as 30,000 people may have been living in Petra. Petra has been misinterpreted by many visitors because they see tombs. It is thought of as a dead city. This was a city that was vital, that was alive. 
Today, a few shattered fragments eroded by time are all that remain of what must have been a splendid civilization. What have you got going now? Well, I'm going to show you the stairs, which is kind of interesting because you can actually see the wear. Archaeologists at Brown University in Rhode Island are attempting to reconstruct ancient Petra, hoping to rebuild the city using computer graphics. Their work has barely scratched the surface. There isn't even a map made of the entire ancient city. There are pieces of it have been mapped. A few excavations here, a few excavations there. Uh, it's a drop in the bucket. We want to look for the hearts and the souls of the people who lived here and to understand better their customs. No one was writing an account of daily life here in Petra. Or if they were, it is something that has eluded us. We have not been able to, to find it. And uh, none of the other excavations that have taken place here have found it either. A few inscriptions and ancient texts speak of mighty kings who were lovers of democracy, of powerful gods and sumptuous feasts, of great triumphs over enemies, and of the right of women to own property. We know little else about the builders of Petra except their name, the Nabataeans. Part of the interesting thing about the Nabataeans, about Petra, is that nobody really knows exactly where they came from. Uh, they were people who, coming out of the desert with little, wanted a lot. They wanted to learn. They clearly were grabbing a little bit of culture from here and a little bit of culture from there. And it, it would be interesting to know how they transformed themselves from a nomadic community to, to a city, to a large, thriving metropolis in one of the major cities of the Middle East. What little we know about the Nabataeans hints at astonishing talents and equally astonishing wealth, which enabled them to build a magnificent city in one of the harshest environments on Earth. About five centuries before the birth of Christ, an obscure tribe of nomads rode out of the vast Arabian desert. They called themselves the Nabatu. The Greeks called them the Nabataeans. To this day, no one knows where they came from or what drove them to their extraordinary achievements. Although it's fairly certain that the Nabataeans originated as a, an Arab nomadic tribe in Northern Arabia. We still really don't know why they settled. That remains a mystery. How and why they began to adopt Roman and Greek culture. While the origins of the Nabataeans may remain obscure, the fact is that they would become one of the wealthiest peoples of the ancient world. But how could such wandering nomads acquire great riches in such a desolate domain? Being nomads, they throw up their tents where they decide to settle for a while and then pull them down and, and go somewhere else. And all of a sudden you have them moving into the site of Petra and creating these huge monuments literally out of nothing. But 2,000 years ago, great riches were frequently encountered in these desert hills. In ancient times, trade was the wealth of the desert. Caravans crossed and recrossed the Middle East, carrying precious cargoes from distant lands. In the desert, control of trade routes was the key to wealth. Among the nomads, extorting tolls from passing caravans became the number one industry. This is a practice widespread in the Bedouin world. Whatever resource you have that can link you to the wider economy, you will exploit it. 
But while other tribes were content to rob their neighbors, the Nabataeans were soon pillaging and trading all over the Near East. They even became pirates, attacking merchant ships in the Red Sea until the Egyptian navy stopped them. From the beginning, the Nabataeans were nomads with ambition. They soon dominated a vast territory stretching from Damascus in the north to parts of Saudi Arabia in the south and east and to the Sinai Peninsula in the west. About 300 BC, they built the city of Petra, strategically located in the only place caravans could pass through the rugged mountains east of the Jordan River. They want to show off their newfound wealth, their newfound importance in the Middle East. And the best way to do that is to build, to show everyone who comes through Petra. And back then, everybody traveled through Petra. It was, it was the nexus of, of all the trade routes through that area. And so what better way to show off your people's newfound power than to have these tremendous buildings? But for Petra to survive, an enormous problem had to be solved. The Nabataeans controlled a domain where only four or five inches of rain fell every year, one of the lowest annual rainfalls on Earth. How could a city survive in a desert? Wealth had created Petra, but only food and water could sustain it. The Nabataeans met this challenge with their usual success. At the entrance to Petra, they dug a massive tunnel through a mountain to control the winter rains. For millions of years, flash floods had rushed wildly through the canyons. The Nabataeans' tunnel channeled these floods into an elaborate water management system. They brought the water in via closed a ceramic pipe, just like the pipes we use today, bringing it uh, down the mountain uh, into the city uh, with aqueducts on top of the mountains. In addition to that, they had two perennial springs in the city area, and they had dozens of water runnels uh, going into catchment basins, into cisterns, a uh, tremendous ability to conserve water and to use it. Traces of Petra's water system are still visible, lined with plaster to prevent the porous sandstone from absorbing precious water. This system gave Petra a reliable water supply. But how could a desert produce enough food to support a city? Here too, Nabataean ingenuity triumphed. We've got this, this great question, why and wh from where did the Nabataeans get all this knowledge? And apparently they brought it back. They went from place to place and we can see this eclecticism in all aspects of their life. And this is part of their engineering skill. Uh, someone came back with an idea. Locally, somebody said, okay, we can do that. This is Avdat, some 60 miles west of Petra in Israel's Negev Desert. 2,000 years ago, it was called Obeda, named for Obedus II, a king of the Nabataeans. Ancient Obeda was a Nabataean fortress and trading post. From its citadel, soldiers riding camels patrolled the caravan routes. And at Obeda, the Nabataeans made the desert bloom. Today, pistachios, almonds, and other crops still flourish at Avdat, watered by the ancient irrigation system of the Nabataeans. In valleys where rainwater collected, Nabataean farmers built networks of dams and ditches to capture it. Using this simple system, the Nabataeans made the desert their breadbasket and fed tens of thousands of people. 
we can see dozens and dozens of threshing floors where the grain was prepared to go to market. We can see aqueducts that had never been recorded to bring the water into a pressurized water system for some of the citizens. Uh, we could see the roads, some for foot traffic only, some for camels, some that would accommodate wheeled vehicles coming into Petra from virtually every compass angle. Of Dot's ancient fields reveal how a city of Petra's size could have survived in the desert. But so many other questions remain. Why would desert nomads carve these massive buildings? What purpose did they serve? How were the Nabataeans able to carve such colossal structures? Archaeologists believe that most of Petra's 800 carved monuments were tombs. The presence of so many tombs has led some to argue that Petra was not a city, but a royal cemetery, like Egypt's Valley of the Kings. But most scholars believe that Petra's tombs were surrounded not by sacred silence, but by the noisy bustle of a metropolis. Nabataean kings built Petra not to prepare for the next world, but to flaunt their wealth and status in this one. The neighbors had tremendous uh, sepulchers and things of that nature. Nabataeans had to one-up them. And so we find the cliffs all around the Petra Basin uh, being adorned with funerary monuments. Whatever their motives for building on such a grand scale, the Nabataeans applied their seemingly limitless energy to the task. In their sandstone canyons, they cut their tombs out of solid rock. Today, we can still see the chisel blows that centuries ago hollowed out a family's mausoleum. In these tombs, the dead joined their ancestors in eternal sleep, while the living held banquets in their memory. Some tombs were of relatively modest size. Others were of staggering proportions. With ingenious technique, the Nabataeans carved entire mountainsides into monuments. The tomb facades are built from the top down. You have to build scaffolding or some kind of a, a ladder several hundred feet up, and you begin by uh, carving out some uh, grooves in the rock. Uh, the idea is to be able to insert wood moisten the wood, and as it expands, it begins to crack blocks. And what you see today, uh, scars uh, on most of the tombs, are the drill holes left over after they've split the rock. The final work is done by actually chiseling. It's, it's literally sculpted. But no one knows whether the Nabataeans themselves designed and carved the great tombs of Petra, or whether they imported architects from Alexandria, Antioch, or other ancient centers of culture. Just as a Paris fashion would be current in uh, 7th Avenue in New York, uh, the current designs and fashions of Greece would be uh, brought to Petra by a number of architects or whatever that may have been hired by the kings who lived here. However, these monuments are Nabataean, built with classical principles. There is an indigenous flavor to them that is very Semitic and very important. One of the great mysteries of Petra is exactly where their architectural ideas came from, because they used a little of everything. Uh, we find uh, material coming from Egypt. Uh, we find material that looks very um, Mesopotamian. Uh, we find Greco-Roman. In ancient times, the grand centerpiece of Petra was its theater. A purely Greco-Roman design which seated 8,000 people. No one is completely sure why the Nabataeans built it, but experts have one theory. Nabataeans were like everybody else in the neighborhood. Uh, once you get a high capital surplus, uh, after all, you can't be a barbarian. 
Uh, you can't be living in the boondocks. Uh, they had to have a main theater because this showed that you were really with it. Petra's architecture hints at how the Nabataeans may have amused themselves and how they may have worshipped and grieved. Fragments of their sensuous artwork suggest refined tastes and worldly pleasures. But what they actually believed remains unclear. Unfortunately, the Nabataeans took their secrets with them to their graves. Sometime in the ancient past, atop the canyons which tower over Petra, Nabataean craftsmen carved away an entire mountaintop, leaving only a pair of obelisks. No one knows why. Some scholars believe that the mysterious obelisks are the images of Nabataean gods. Religion is another mystery of Petra. We have virtually no documentation on the religion of the people. We do have inscriptions that mention various deities, and we have carvings all over the place that apparently represent those deities. Scattered throughout Petra are mysterious carved monuments called God Blocks. The gods of ancient Near Eastern nomads forbade their worshippers to know their names or behold their faces. The Nabataeans' chief god was Dushara. His name means He of the Mountains of Shara. Shara is a mountain range near Petra. Beyond his name, we know nothing about Dushara. Petra's god blocks and obelisks may have been images of him. But as the Nabataeans became wealthy, sophisticated city dwellers who adopted Greek culture, Dushara would not remain faceless for long. Dushara came in and I suspect, although we, here again we have no documentation, that he acquired the attributes of everybody in the neighborhood. Could this have been a later image of Dushara? Archaeologists believe that the Nabataeans merged their god with Greek and Egyptian deities like Zeus, Dionysus, and Osiris. Semites, generally speaking, don't uh, anthropomorphize their deities. And of course, once we get into the Hellenistic period, this becomes an important deal because the Greeks and Romans had sculptures of their deities. And after all, if we're going to be sophisticated, modern, We've got to do the same thing. But even sophisticated Nabataeans may have celebrated some rather sinister rituals. At the top of a mountain high above Petra, the Nabataeans carved a mysterious altar. It was almost certainly a place of sacrifice where the priests of Petra slew offerings to their gods. But what did they sacrifice here? Or whom? The Bible tells of widespread human sacrifice in the ancient land of Canaan, just across the Jordan River from the lands of the Nabataeans. The priests of Baal, god of the Canaanites, sacrificed children on mountaintops. Yahweh, god of Israel, demanded that Abraham sacrifice his only son Isaac on a mountaintop. At the last moment, Yahweh provided a ram as a substitute. But there is evidence that for the Nabataeans, there were no substitutions. An inscription found near Petra tells of a priest sacrificing a young man, perhaps his own son. Other ancient accounts tell of boys and girls killed and offered to the Nabataean goddess, Alusa. One text commemorates the annual cutting of a young boy's throat at a Nabataean city some 200 miles from Petra. 
And so the altar of Petra's high place may once have run with human blood, a gift to gods whose representations now live on in Petra's obelisks. Speculation about human sacrifice sparks heated debate, debate that may never be resolved. Simply because we have an altar, people immediately start saying, well, did they sacrifice people? I doubt it. By the time we get to the first century, everybody is pretty sophisticated. I mean, we don't do that anymore. Presumably, as time went on, child sacrifice became less common. But there are a few scant references in some Nabataean texts uh, found in Peter and nearby that suggest that occasionally it was still a practice, and that would not be surprising given the long history of child sacrifice in the Western Semitic world. And it makes more sense than we might think. Uh, most of these were fertility cults. The gods had given you the gift of children, and it was only proper that you should return a part of the gift at least. So it was a great honor in, in a way, uh, although a sort of dubious honor. The Nabataean gods continue to puzzle archaeologists, but a recent spectacular discovery leaves no doubt that Petra was eventually conquered by another god. In 1992, archaeologists uncovered the ruins of a 6th century church adorned with magnificent mosaics. After nearly 2,000 years, the church mosaics of Petra fairly glow with life and surprise us with their worldly themes. Animals, plants, and human figures parade before us in delightful, lively scenes, which seem to have little to do with the Bible. But there is little doubt that the building was consecrated to the worship of Christ. At ACOR, the American Center of Oriental Research in Amman, Jordan, staff members are trying to fit together an enormous jigsaw puzzle of shattered stone fragments from the Petra Church. As the work of restoration progresses, the brilliant artistry of the stone carving is revealed. The people of Petra must have lavished as much money and skill on building their church as they did on tombs and pagan temples. But beyond its artistic splendors, the Petra church has yielded an even more remarkable find. Over 50 papyrus scrolls were found inside the church, all of them reduced to carbonized lumps by a fire which destroyed the church soon after it was built. In a special laboratory at Acor, a team of scholars is carefully separating the charred layers of the scrolls and preparing them to be translated. Ancient sources suggest that in the early years of Christianity, heretics who disagreed with orthodox dogma were exiled from nearby lands to Petra. Perhaps the Petra scrolls will reveal their teachings. Maybe as fragments are reassembled, unknown, forbidden gospels will be revealed. So far, all the scrolls translated have been administrative church records. But Dr. Jaco Frosen, leader of the restoration team, has found that even these mundane records can give tantalizing glimpses of the lives of ordinary citizens of Petra. One such fragment was the last will and testament of a man named Hor. I shall leave behind all my belongings to the possession of Apostle Petrus, the most holy priest, on the condition that they will pay from it the provision of food and clothing to my mother, Thayus, during all her lifetime, even if it may be half of the whole property, and so on. These texts are very important for the archaeologists because they tell us about the 
plots, the houses, the churches and the monasteries of, of Petra and uh, of, of the neighborhood. For example, we have a lot of, of um, divisions of property with a very accurate uh, description of the plot itself and of the neighbors. And that's why we, we know exactly in some parts of, of Petra who was living where and where we have the churches and monasteries and so on. Only a few of the 50 Petra scrolls have been translated. As restoration continues, who knows what secrets they will reveal to us. From the scrolls, we may at last begin to decipher the daily life of Petra and learn more about why the city eventually died. For in the 6th century, when the Petra scrolls were written, the Nabataeans' greatest days were past. By the time of Christ, the Nabataean Empire was nearly 500 years old and still going strong. But the Nabataeans' prosperity was to cost them their independence. The people of Petra had grown so rich from taxing caravans that they attracted the attention of the world's most powerful empire, the Empire of Rome. The all-powerful Romans were becoming annoyed with Petra. They were tired of paying higher prices for goods that passed through Nabataean territory. The Roman emperors decided that if caravans paid taxes to the Nabataeans, the Nabataeans could pay taxes to Rome. The legions were sent marching toward Petra. Two expeditions were sent down to conquer Petra. The first one was bought off, and the second one got about halfway down, and the emperor died, and they had to turn around and go back. But the Romans really wanted some control over this whole area. Finally, when a Nabataean king died in 106 AD, the Roman Emperor Trajan sent a legion to announce that from now on, Petra belonged to Rome. The Nabataeans had little choice but to accept Roman rule. Petra began its new life as capital of the Roman province of Arabia Petraea. The Romans built a road through the middle of the city. They installed a governor, and they wisely allowed the Nabataeans to pursue business as usual. It was nature, not Rome, that put an end to Petra. According to ancient records, at 9 p.m. on May 19th in the year 363 A.D., a cataclysmic earthquake struck Petra. At least half of the city was destroyed. The earthquake's timing could not have been worse. By the end of the fourth century, a beleaguered Rome was abandoning its Arabian frontier. The trade routes were shifting. Merchants were leaving. After the earthquake struck, Petra never recovered. As time went on, the Nabataeans abandoned it. These people had talent, and they simply took their talent with them and left. Uh, there wasn't really much to be done. The, the storefronts along the paved street, for example, are, are completely covered with rubble. Uh, so that really there wasn't much left. By the 7th century, when Muhammad's armies brought Islam, Petra had become a hidden secret of the mountains. The Nabataeans had vanished into the desert as mysteriously as they had once emerged from it, but not without leaving one final legacy to the Middle East. The Nabataean alphabet evolved into the alphabet of Arabic, the language spoken today by millions from Morocco to the Persian Gulf.
Today, the desert, like a vast dry ocean, has closed over the Nabataeans who once ruled its great expanses. Life has returned to its timeless ways, while archaeologists puzzle over the riddle of Petra. What happened to the Nabataeans? I don't know. I kind of, I like to think that they are still there. Are the people that we are living with when we excavate the site, are they descendants of the Nabataeans? I like to think so. They are so proud of their Petra. This is their home. The Badul, to my way of thinking, are Nabataeans in spirit and certainly Nabataeans in pride. We may never fully understand the Nabataeans. Much of their once great civilization has been lost forever. But even the little we know today is enough to appreciate their unique genius and astonishing accomplishments. It was a civilization that flourished, then vanished, leaving a spectacular, tantalizing achievement carved in stone. A timeless monument to the passion of those who go in search of history.